right. Happy first day of summer, everybody. Woohoo! In Florida, that typically means lots of sunshine. It's a little on the overcast uh, um, side today, which is okay because we will have plenty of hot, steamy days um, officially starting with today. So, with uh, that in mind, we thought it would be a perfect time to talk about pool safety. Everybody um, likes to think about summertime, of course, across the rest of the country, because this could really pertain to everybody else across the country, um, likes to think of the first day of summer as when they officially go out to the parks and go out to water parks or go out to their pool, or they're all looking at getting everything set up in their pool. So what perfect time then to have Mr. Inspectigator, who is actually uh, kind of known as the pool inspector guru, in the home inspection world, not that everybody around here really knows and understands that, but in the uh, broad scope of inspections across the United States, John is known as the expert in pool safety and pool information and all things pool. So with that, I will pass the mic over to John Bolton. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And what I'm going to do, I'm gonna immediately going to go ahead and share my screen. Screen two. Okay, do you see? Uh, yes. Whoops. Okay, there we go. There you go. You see it? Yep. Okay, Perfect. fantastic. Uh, I will go through this pretty quick because there is so much content. I've got uh, like 52 slides. Uh, not all of them are, um, are, are going to take any time. <clears throat> but point is, I've got a lot of information because safety stuff is so uh, vitally important. And today we're gonna to talk about some suction entrapment hazards, meaning the, the bottom drain where uh, children can get stuck, uh, barrier requirements, things having to do with the fencing uh, around uh, pool areas, uh, GFCI protection, most everybody's familiar with GFCI protection, ground fault circuit interrupting protection, and bonding and straight voltage, which may come as a foreign uh, topic to you, but that's okay. We will make this uh, easy. We've got this little series going on now uh, in order to try to make you, the real estate agent, uh, help you differentiate yourself. If you can't differentiate yourself from every other real estate agent, you are every other real estate agent, and then you become a commodity. And why would I use you and not them if they're offering me something else? So We've got a, a several multi, uh, several topics that we're talking about, so uh, look out for the next one. I do like to appreciate all veterans. Uh, I, I've got a place in my heart for you guys, so thank you all so much for serving. Really appreciate that. Uh, initially, we were going to go try and do this by the pool, and we were going to go hang out because this is a gorgeous, gorgeous backyard area here, right? Uh, this is the Teresa Angelo compound that we were going to go to. And when uh, Mr. Angelo found out, well, that was kind of uh, nipped right in the bud right there. So you're stuck with me on <clears throat> this presentation here anyway. So let's start right out with bonding. What the heck is bonding? And, and actually, let me start with everything electrical about pools is found in the NEC National Electric Code 680. Chapter 680, NEC 680, and in NEC 6826A, uh, they're talking about the purpose of bonding. The purpose of bonding is to eliminate voltage gradient, okay, to eliminate voltage gradient. That's the purpose. The easiest analogy I, I can give you is that of if you had, say, a ladder, um, you know, a metal ladder going into the pool, and they're, they're both metal on each side. If one side was energized and the other side wasn't, well, there's a potential for the current to go from point A to point B or a voltage gradient. If me, the bather goes up and grabs both sides, now I complete that gradient and the current flows through me, goes across my heart, bad things happen, that kind of thing. So in order to eliminate voltage gradient, everything is bonded together. Uh, bonding is essentially connecting all metal components together. So if you think of it kind of like male bonding or personal bonding, everybody's standing in a circle holding hands, everybody has the exact same potential. When somebody lets go, now you create that, that voltage gradient or that potential, right? So by keeping everything all tied together, all metal components tied together, we eliminate that. And I'm talking all metal components. 
if in and this back way up to when they're building, they're constructing the pool, you've got a hole and you've got like a longer burger basket of steel. There's a lot of steel in the middle of that concrete pond. Okay. It, and it literally, it looks like a longer burger basket. If you, if you all remember those back in the day, how popular those were. So there's a lot of steel associated in forming this, this large pool or spa area, steps, swim outs, these kind of things. There's steel inside there. So all of that rebar, uh, any wire mesh that might be in walls or sidewalks, decks, that kind of thing, metal ladders, pool light cases, uh, pump casings, heater casings, the screen enclosure, okay? If you've got a soffit, fascia, gutter, porches, anything inside uh, this, uh, this, there's a magic box that goes around the pool area. Anything metal associated with the pool and inside this magic box must be bonded, okay? If you think, if, if you're, if you can picture the pool as a bowl, and going out five feet horizontally and 12 feet vertically, there you create this magic box, okay? Five feet horizontally and 12 feet vertically. Anything metal inside that box must be bonded, okay? Uh, this is a, a, a real good visual uh, representation of what I'm talking about. So in this illustration, they have cut out the uh, the the pool, the, the finish and the concrete and whatnot. So you can see that long a burger basket of steel and via a system of copper wires, number eight copper wires, everything is connected. So the, if you had a metal fencing that went around there, antenna, uh, the ladder, the, the frame for a sliding glass door or a window, uh, if you had a, um, um, a diving board, uh, the pool light casing, uh, we mentioned the pool pump itself and the uh, casing around the heater. All of those metal components must be bonded or all holding hands in order to eliminate voltage gradient, okay? A lot of these are concealed, like this one here. This is called an acorn clamp. Uh, this will all be encased in concrete. You won't be able to see it. But that's the, the, my whole point is all of the steel will be bonded. Here's a pool light casing that will be encased in concrete. You won't be able to see it. Uh, but during construction, you can see on the metal conduit, you can see on the rebar here, it's all held together with this number eight copper wire, solid copper wire. We're talking decks that go around and there are different ways to do this, but this is a good illustration. There will be points of contact with all the steel associated with that deck. Uh, what you can see and what you've probably seen before is the bonding lugs on the pool pump like here. Now, these are just two different kinds. They comes from the manufacturer. They're like the bonding lug is there. It's nothing that the contractor, the installing contractor has to create or install himself. It already exists. It's already there. All that has to be done during construction is make that connection, is attach the wire, the bonding wire to the pool pump. Now, this isn't the most attractive thing, but it is required. Here we've got the metal frame of the sliding glass door. Here it's exposed. You see, now it's, it's painted over, but you've got that contact there. And this wire is again encased in concrete. It's no doubt attached to the steel in the deck, which is attached to the steel in the pool, which is attached to the pool light casing, which is attached to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You start to get the, my drift. Here, if you've got something non-metallic in between metallic things, then you have to have something called a jumper. And here you can see the jumper wire that connects this portion of the screen cage to the uh, adjacent portion of the screen cage. This one came from a, a local inspector friend of mine, Christian Hoffman. It, here, you've got a heat pump. It's within five feet horizontally of the pool, so it must be bonded. Okay, this isn't even a heat pump for the heating the water. This is a heat pump for the house. But we're that close. So therefore, if you, you, know, you follow the, the red arrow, on the other side, there's a bonding connection from the casing on that pool pump to the screen cage. Remember, everything holding hands. The screen cage, we often see the, the connection exposed like this. 
Sometimes it's buried in, in leaves, mulch, dirt, that kind of thing, which actually leads me to my next point. Because not all of these connections are visible, what do you do? We can, as an inspector, all we can say is visible connections here, non-visible connections there kind of thing. And when we have that new ur construction, and I don't have a, spe uh, a specific date where they started concealing these bond wires, but as far as a visual inspection, we can only state that these components do not have vi uh, visible uh, connect, uh, bonding connection points unless we test, which I'll get to in, in a second. But when they're building this, there's a guy that comes out and does bonding checks. So what we will say is this component, this window, door frame, gutter, soffit, fascia, et cetera, has no visible bond connections. Check with the municipality or maybe even the seller for a record of that inspection because the municipal guy comes out and here's his form and he checks all these points and he signs off because it is a very, very big deal. I believe another local inspector, Sean McNeil sent me this picture. Now you may be thinking, well, we don't know when bonding stuff was applied or actually we do. And there's a guy, Jerry Peck, who has researched this and provided this on his website uh, he's a professional construction litigant, uh, not, a, not an attorney, but a profession, professional uh, code guy, if you will, askcodeman.com. And he did the, the whole historical research here. And bonding has been around actually since 1962. You know, that's even before some of us were born. Back then, if you look at the top of this, it is, uh, they used to call it grounding. Okay. In 1962, and it talks about all these metal components, okay? Back then it was a number 14 wire. Number 14 is a very small wire, which is why just three years later, they went to a much larger number eight wire in 1965. So even at that larger size wire, it's been around before some of us have been born. Uh, that's where they started to change. They started to refer to it as bonding because it, it's, it's a totally different concept than grounding. Bonding and grounding are two totally different things. And that's another conversation that maybe we can address in the future, Bobby Lynn. Yeah. Okay. But it's been around for a very, very long time. Okay. Here, this is, I'm going to see, hopefully this is going to play. There we go. This is a demonstration of us actually checking bonding, proving bonding in the field. Today, we are checking the bonding and I have, I've got the other end of my long lead at the, at the pump bond right now. And I will check the full light right here. What you can do is on the camera. Can you hear it tone out? You can hear it tone out, so that may be a cut. Because the patient soffit are within that magic box, that five and 12 box, we need to check that as well. You hear it tone. You don't hear that. It toned out. So we know that both the soft foot fascia and the cool light are correctly bonded. So that's how we prove it when we can't see it. We can actually do bonding tests. And yes, we charge a little bit more for that. I don't remember how much. It's not that, that much, but we can quickly prove that all metal components associated in that magic box and with the pool are actually bonded and safe. Oop. There's also stray voltage. And actually there's always stray voltage in the earth. Okay, this is just something that we live with. What we don't want to live with is stray voltage in the pool or the pool area. So there are some devices like this one on the far left that it's, it's, uh, it floats around in the pool when it detects voltage, you know, bells and whistles go off, but it only goes down to 20 volts. And that's a pretty large number. And I'll show you why that's uh, significant here in a second. The, the two in the middle, one is meant as a constant monitor. So around say boat yards, 
uh, marinas, you know, that kind of thing. It's always in service. It's not something somebody has to come check. So that's always there. The other component from that same company is one that's very similar to what you saw in the video there, where I can take a, and go check individual components. This third one is one that I actually had in my, my, what do you, the, my shopping cart. I was going to buy this. You, you throw the yellow device in the water. It has a leash on it. And I, you walk around the whole pool. It floats. If it detects stray voltage, and bells and whistles go off and it lets you know. You can see we went from 20 volt detection to 1.7 volts so down to 0 0.017 volts. Very small. Then I started reading the reviews on this and they weren't real good. So we didn't purchase this because I can accomplish the same thing with my amp meter already in the ohms setting. And that goes down to 0 0.00 something. And why is that significant? Because here, uh, okay, we quote the authoritative source, the result, and the how small of uh, current can cause damage. Okay, and look at some of these numbers. Like, oh, look, all the way down to 0 0.07 amps uh, from whatever sources this physics source uh, can be felt painful, uh, lose muscle control, and can be fatal. Holy cow, it is a real big deal. This primarily occurs around marinas and that kind of thing where you have a whole lot more electrical devices and bad things happen. So around marinas and docks, those kind of things, it's actually in the NEC, it, it's required to have a yearly check. And it, it, we, we're not even allowed to do those as home inspectors. It requires a licensed electrician with a very specific um, certification to do those kind of things. But around residential pools, like I was saying, we can use a device like you saw me using earlier here and check it ourselves around the pools and actually prove that stray voltage exists or it doesn't exist. That's the only other way to do it. Um, oh, something very interesting is this, this has only been around since 2014 in the, in the code cycle, 2014 code cycle, where outlet supplying pool pump motors connected to single phase uh, two, 120, 240 volt branch circuits, whether by receptacle meaning you have a pool pump that's plugged in or a pool pump that's a direct connect meaning breaker wire fixture, okay? Either way must be GFCI protected. Oh, just like, yes, the, your kitchen and bathroom GFCI protection, that pool pump has got to be GFCI protected. Now, just because it's only been in the code section since 2014 doesn't mean you don't have to have it, okay? I, obviously, in Florida, we use pools year-round. The pumps run every day, 365 days a year, and therefore, the life expectancy of pool pumps is really actually not that long. Okay, whereas like up north, they winterize everything and you don't have the run time on a northern pool pump like you do in, in Florida. So because it has a shorter life expectancy, they're replaced more often. So we can even have something that, that maybe when the pool was constructed, it wasn't required to have the GFCI protection, but now you've replaced the pump and it is required. It's not very hard to do, but this is something you should be looking for because you know, nobody's going to get sued for the small things, but if somebody's electrocuted, everybody gets named in the suit, every real estate agent, every home inspector, everybody involved in that transaction is going to get blamed and, and going, to, going to be named in the suit. So we can easily eliminate some of this liability using knowledge, our skill sets, our tools, uh, that kind of thing to prove that these are safe. So, Moving on with the safety theme here, uh, barriers. Barriers are big. This particular picture a friend of mine posted one day, she lives up in one of these Northern states and they were all excited because it was pool season. You know, unlike us, you know, we chuckle because pool season is every day, but to them it was pool season. It's officially open. They got all the toys, blew them all up, threw them in the pool. And she simply posted the picture as, you know, hey, we're excited type of thing. I looked at this and went, oh my God, I see liability because 
what does a child see? Right? They see opportunity. They see a toy. I mean, for, for all we know, there could be a child on the bottom of this pool right now. You can't see them. So it's just, it's a cover picture. So it makes you think, okay? Now, let me step it down a notch. And I don't mean to be Debbie Downer. However, this is serious, like serious stuff. And one day on one of our Facebook groups, uh, an inspector had posted, so let's talk insurability issues and lawsuits. If anyone has news articles, personal stories, et cetera, uh, ins insurance stuff, you know, please post here. So I started reading and I don't know this person, Joseph Mellon. I don't know where he's from. He states, an inspector did not mention pool safety equipment, and on move-in day, the toddler walked out the back door, jumped in the pool, and drowned. Now, this is obviously a travesty. It's devastating, and none of us, I know none of you all out there watching, wants this to, to be on your conscience or happen or be involved in any type of suit. You know, we want to avoid something like this, and it's not that difficult, especially when you have... Uh, a, a home inspection company that's knowledgeable in bonding and barrier systems and uh, electrical um, safety and these kind of things. So I highly recommend you, you, you look into this. And at least now you'll be a little bit more versed on some of these things than, than most real estate agents. And like we said in the beginning, if you can't differentiate yourself from every other, home, uh, every other real estate agent or home inspector for that fact, then you are every other real estate agent. So Bottom line is the pool must be protected, okay? There must be barrier systems, and there's a lot of options. So we're going to talk about some of the options. They, ha they have to be blocked by a fence uh, or some kind of screen cage, something like that. And fences and screen doors must open away from the pool. Why must they be open away from the pool, you ask? I'm glad you did so. Because children learn to push before they learn to pull. Okay, that's why. So now you've got that visual in your mind, you get it, and this will be something easy for you to keep be on the lookout for. So fences, uh, screen doors, those kind of things must open away. And the barrier around that pool must be at least 48 inches high, must be. So when you go see those, those the mesh fences that were so popular here, that we're so familiar with, they must be at least 48 inches high. When you have a barrier that's over hardscape, like a decking, sidewalk, concrete, that kind of thing, then the clearance to that is just like it is on a handrail. We've got four inches. So a child can't put their head underneath. So over hardscape, the barriers, 48 inch barriers got to come within four inches. So some uh, small child can't crawl underneath. If it's over soft scape, like grass, mulch, dirt, rubber, you know, floating rubber uh, mulch, the, these kind of things, then that is decreased to two inches. Okay. So it's smaller because of things like erosion and the ability to dig those kind of things. Now these, the gates and screen doors must be self-closing, self-latching must be. So this is why your whole life, it's always been like that because it's been in the big book of rules forever. OK, you just don't even think about it. So they must be self-closing, self-latching, uh, open outward. And that release mechanism must be no lower than 54 inches. So your whole life, you've walked out the screen cage and just stuck your hand straight in front of you. Right. As opposed to like when you go to the front door, you typically reach down for the doorknob. The release mechanism on the barriers is going to be at 54 inches. That's why. And here's uh, uh, some pictures from a, an actual inspection. And the top left picture here is a macro picture where I'm at. The top right picture is the micro picture zooming in. So I haven't moved anything, just showing you that this release mechanism right there, a child could come up and reach that. It's below 54 inches. It's at 48. So yeah, I, I get we're being a little picky, but the worst case scenario is what you have to inspect to and you have to be prepared for because if somebody drowns, remember we're, we are all named in the suit. So it's got to be fit, uh, 48 inches 
And then this bottom picture from the same house. And, and I look at this and, and ladies, this is kind of like a guy thing. The very first thing that goes through my head, I looked at that and I looked at my gut and I, and I thought, I bet I can squeeze through there. You know, this is just the first thing. And as a little boy, we actually enact, we, you know, we engage, we, we try to squeeze through there. So that would be a safety issue as well. Now, what do we see here? This is not a, a cheap house. This is a, quite an expensive house in the Heathrow area, I believe. Okay, just because the price of the home is expensive doesn't make it immune to problems. This, although the release mechanism is at least 54 inches, the door opens inward and it cannot. It has never been uh, able to open inward. So this is somebody's got to fix it. Right. It's a it's a, it's a two step process. It's a phone call and a check and it's done. Everybody's safe. And we move on. Uh, another picture from an inspection where the remember the ground clearance over soft scape. Two inches. OK, here we clearly have six plus. The nice thing is anybody can fix this. Anybody with a shovel. Right. Very simple. Now, what about those above ground pools? If that. Above ground pool is 48 inches high. There's your barrier. Remember, the barrier has got to be at least 48 inches high. If it's not, then you're still going to have to comply with all of the barrier requirements. And like this is real attractive, right, with a, a fence on top of the pool. But you've got to have that to comply. Now, we've talked about a barrier being 48 inches high, but the release mechanism at 54. How does that happen? This way, that's what those plungers are for. That, that complies with that 54 inch. That's where that comes from. Now you know. Now it's, that'll be stuck up here forever, right? I mentioned those mesh fences before that go around pools. Those mesh fences, the clearance is a little bit different. You've seen those your whole life come almost down touching the deck. Okay, that's because the big book of rules says it's got to come down within one inch of the deck and you can't, somebody shouldn't be like a toddler shouldn't be able to lift it up more than four inches and crawl underneath. Make sense. So mesh fence down within one inch of the deck, and then you can't lift it up more than four inches and crawl under. One of the other big, huge things is suction entrapment, meaning being stuck on the main drain. And there have, it's happened. There's been what they call evisceration where somebody has gotten stuck on there and it's pulled the innards out, which is a disgusting way to die. And we learn from our mistakes. And now there are things in place that help us avoid those. So we'll, we'll touch on those real quick. New er pools will have, uh, there, there are different kinds of drain covers and some are anti-hair, anti-snare, type, and I, and I believe I got, I got a few pictures coming up here. Um, you can have multiple drains, okay, if you don't have an unblockable, which I'll get here in a sec, but multiple drains have got to be three feet apart, and that way somebody couldn't sit on one or, or both at the same time because they're three feet apart, and if you did sit on one, this is a vacuum break. The second one is a vacuum break. Now, interesting, with the safety dates are irrelevant, okay? Like we as inspectors could really care less that this 1986 kitchen didn't require GFCI protection. It's always a recommendation as a safety upgrade in that scenario. But since September 6, 2011, suction outlet covers, meaning main drain covers, were manufactured, distributed, or enter into commerce, okay? What else is there? Like nothing. Any Main drain like that in residential must conform to these certain safety standards, okay? Uh, they shall, it, it's even in our, from Florida, it's even in our building code. So again, not my opinion or anything like that. You can look up, go to iccsafe.org and you can view the Florida building code for free. And in chapter 4501.6.6, they start talking about shall comply with these safety standards. What are these safety standards? They actually, this is the first time they have addressed flow. If you think of that main drain, if the flow is very hard, very strong, lots of water moving through it, somebody or something can get stuck easily. 
if it, on the other extreme, if that flow and that quantity of water is just a trickle, just, just for a visual here, if it's just a trickle, well, then somebody can't get stuck. It's, it's not enough force to hold them down. So the address, the, the flow rate there, and if you're interested in the numbers, it's there. Now, this is something or, or nothing that anybody can prove without uh, special devices. So we, we, even as home inspectors, can't test what the flow is. But uh, as far as multiple outlets, they've got to be three feet apart, which makes sense. When you have multiple uh, drains, they've got to be at least three feet apart uh, and or on different planes. So you can't block both. Uh, in other words, it could be on the side of the sidewall and on the, on the bottom of the pool. That's fine. They address blockable or unblockable outlets, meaning suction outlets. What is an unblockable? The definition of an unblockable is one that is larger than 18 by 23, okay? So if this is 18 by 23, then the suction outlet or the drain will be larger. That's unblockable, that's considered unblockable. Or a channel drain where it's, it's very long, and if you think about like when you go to Disney and you go to get out of the pool and there's the little ledge that like people sit on and that drain goes all the way around the perimeter of the pool, that's a, that, that's a, a channel drain right there. I believe I've got a picture of some newer ones like that for your, for your visual. But here's an example. And the only time in my, my career that I have found these drains less than three feet apart. And this was just a few years ago. You see uh, right before Christmas 2018. And how that happened, I have no earthly idea. No, it's never been code to do that, ever. It just happened. We're still building houses with humans until Jesus comes back. It is what it is. So here's a visual on the unblockable drains, okay? Something that is the drain that's larger than 18 by 23. See, we can't block it with the, using this element, this blocking element. You can't block the whole thing. Uh, a visual, <clears throat> excuse me, a visual on the channel type drains, that same blocking element, you can't block the whole thing because it's, it's too long, right? Now in practical, here's a much newer pool, again, just a few years ago. This is the macro shot, top left, okay? Top, uh, bottom left is the floor drain, which is right there, right? Am I, can, can you see my cursor? No. No, I'm on the wrong one. Try to get, yeah. No, no, we can. Now you can? Okay, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. I've got it on two screens. <clears throat> so this bottom left drain is right there on the bottom, okay? This bottom right drain, the sidewall drain is right up here on the, in this top left picture, okay? So this is just the macro shot. These two are the micro shots. So we're on dissimilar planes and we have channel type drains that are considered unblockable. The top right picture is just the channel drain inside a, a small spa area. So when we see this, it's a serious entrapment hazard. It takes two screws. It's a piece of plastic with two screws. So it's a very easy fix and no need to panic because just about anybody can fix this, right? It's a righty tighty thing and you're done. To give you an example of this hazard, this was a, a condo area and we were doing, it was an interior only condo. And back in the day, we used to carry our laptop into the, the kitchen and stand there and type. And I was walking laptop from truck to the, the, the job and I hear this sound, this suction sound. And I'm, I look over and I don't see anything. And this happens a couple of times as I'm carrying tools and ladders and whatnot back and forth. And I finally, I, of course, I've got to go look. And this is over the, the spa area, like, you know, jacuzzi area. Uh, this is not, this drain is not larger than 18 by 23. Remember, this is a long time ago, several years ago. And this right here is a vortex, okay? Just like when you're, you, you take a shower, you, you watch the water go down the drain. This is physics. It happens the same way every single time you take a shower, it just works, right? Thank you, God. This vortex this, and the draw from that main drain, remember, and we're only a few feet deep in the jacuzzi area, was so strong. I could watch that look just like a funnel cloud that you've seen on the news, where it goes stronger and stronger and stronger, and it actually touches down. And what would happen, it was pulling 
that much water several feet down. And when it would connect, and all of a sudden you had drain to the atmosphere and I was hearing this big suction sound. The serious entrapment hazard. I mean, just scary. Like if we were the manager owner of this place, this is some, you shut the pool down and fix it now before somebody gets hurt. Uh, hopefully this will help. Uh, this will work too. Uh, this is a, a physical where you can actually watch this video, but this is in a skimmer. So it's, it, we don't have that danger, but you'll see what I'm talking about. And it's not going to work for me. Uh, oh, well, uh, it, it, you can actually watch this. The suction from the skimmer was so strong. It actually did the same thing. It pulled air all the way down to it. Now, this is an example of old school drain. This is what you know, a lot of us grew up with. It's flat and it's completely open on the top. So it would be very easy to put your stomach on it or, or sit on it and become trapped. So newer covers will be convex as opposed to flat. Okay, It's harder to cover something that's convex all the way around than it is flat. Okay, Now, with this particular one, you st you're still in danger of somebody with long hair uh, becoming entwined and, and trapped down there and stuck. So the anti-hair, anti-snare, whatever you want to call it, looks something like this. Somebody with long hair, it could be pulled in, but easily pulled right back out. It doesn't get trapped around uh, in a loop like that. Now, when we were talking about multiple drains, you could have two, you could have four. This is a good visual. If somebody were to somehow block this drain on the left, the drain on the right would still function. It's, so it's a, it's a vacuum break, if you will. Now that you know, when you see this in the field, right, this is what we see all the time. Now that you see this, you know what it looks like underneath, that those are connected via pipe and it's a vacuum break. Okay. Now, I wanted to take just a second and talk about uh, the chlorine shortage now. There was a large fire that destroyed like the largest chlorine manufacturer in the United States in Louisiana a couple few years ago, and it has put a real hurt in. If you own a pool, you probably are familiar. You've seen prices go up, and there may be some alternatives, okay, converting to a, a salt pool, but our pool contractor tells me that even those are becoming hard to come by because a lot of people are doing that. Uh, converting over to salt means you don't have to go purchase chlorine because the salt pool manufactures its own chlorine. But if, you, if you're not unfamiliar, now, now maybe go take a look on Amazon or your local pool store and, and look about maybe converting to a salt pool because of this chlorine shortage. Now, why else is this a big deal? Uh, if you're losing water, you're gonna have to add more chemicals and you're going to have to add more water further diluting the current chemical makeup. So pool leaks are becoming an even bigger deal because of this chlorine shortage. So anybody with a pool, we recommend a pool leak test. Now we do uh, electronic pool leak detection. We do dye testing and some other uh, with sounding and some of those kind of things. In a simple real estate transaction, an electronic test is a, a real good test. Our equipment measures water loss down to like one ten thousandth of an inch. So it's very, very sensitive. It's very, very quick. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. And if there is a problem, well, then you ask the seller to address it. So it really doesn't matter where the leak is coming from. As somebody else goes and finds it, you know, you look like a hero. You, you had that service for them, repaired for them. They don't experience the headaches that, that come with it. Uh, when we do that, we produce a report, looks something like this, right? And it will actually prove whether or not there is a leak or there is no leak at the time. Now, because nothing is 100%, you could actually have debris uh, temporarily clog a, a hole in a leak. And that just is what it is. And then the pool guy comes with a brush and clears it and it leaks again. So. Not only do we recommend it when you're buying the home, but maybe at least a yearly, maybe um, a, a biannual test uh, because it is pretty in, uh, inexpensive and you'll know and it's going to save you money in the long run with your, your chemical maintenance. So that was a lot of stuff, I know, and I went pretty quick. 
And I just want to leave you with a very big thank you. And one of my very favorite quotes from Tony Robbins, that somebody right now is in the hospital begging for the opportunities that you guys have. So uh, I appreciate everybody that steps up and differentiates themselves from every other real estate agent. And if you ever have questions, please feel free to give us a holler. We are always here. Phone calls are free. You know, advice is always free. And, uh, you know, feel free to use this for your home inspections and, as well. Absolutely. Inspectagator.com or even easier, 407-678-HOME.